WSDQ Dunlap, WEPG South Pittsburgh, The Copperhead, WSDT Saudi Daisy, Chattanooga. The viewpoints expressed on Liberty Works Radio Network are not necessarily those of the network, its affiliates, or sponsors. This is Liberty Works Radio Network. Now live from coast to coast and around the globe, more real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. Welcome to Liberty Works Radio Network, LWRN.net. You've reached Freedom Forum with Delegate Mike Schmeagel, and if you want to call in today, please do at 410-848-9191. That's 410-848-9191. And we're going to be taking a variety of subjects here today. It's the first show of 2015. And I'd like to get uh, from some of you the political predictions, what you see is going to happen in the 2015, um, what you'd like to see happen. Uh, One of the things that I think is the uh, biggest problem out there right now that I'd like to see people tackle in 2015 is with respect to the false information that we accept when they tell us that unemployment is gone down, that it'll Obama is helping to take care of the unemployment rate, and they show what it was when we were under Bush and what it is now, and what nobody tells you is the real unemployment rate is in double digits. When we allow the media just sits back and they accept that we've allowed the changing of the formulas, that you look at that employment, anybody who's unemployed, you're unemployed for a year, a year and a half, we take you off the rolls. We assume that you just stop looking. So the longer the unemployment is, the deeper it is, the more manipulated the statistics are. And that's something in 2015 I'd like to see us stop and say, wait a minute, let's talk about the real figures. Don't accept it when you see the media or others sit out there and tell you something that you know is false. It's kind of like when they talk about now the inflation rate. They've changed it. If you don't look at food when you're looking at inflation and health care cost, how can you have a true predictor of what the actual economy is like? When I'm predicting for 2015 is a great drop in our economic opportunities, and I see a huge collapse that's going to far exceed anything that happened uh, with the housing bubble burst. Because currently, we've been using quantitative easement for how many years now? We're over almost $18 trillion in debt. The quantitative easing uh, makes the stock market artificially look like it's doing well. You see these numbers where you're at 18000 Well, that's our artificial. You cannot lose the stock market. There's no place else to put your money because there's no interest being paid anywhere. There's no stocks or bonds to go to. The gas prices have fallen tremendously because the orders are down around the world for using it because there's no manufacturing. There's no orders for that. So we have this false idea that somehow we're doing well when we've totally manipulated and changed our whole economic system to be based on a falsehood. The fiat money that we're printing has not been earned. When I was growing up, my father used to say, you want to dance, you got to pay the fiddler. But we haven't paid the fiddler. And I think in 2015, that's when we're going to have to pay the fiddler. You're looking at Russia. Uh, China has complete cities. Russia, we've got these booming economic... uh, cities and buildings that they show, and they're all industrial. When you go in, nobody lives there. They're empty. They're building people-less cities because the economy is meant to look. If you give you a person a job and you build something up, it looks nice. But if there's nobody who can afford to live in those cities, if there's nobody who can afford those apartments, isn't this all going to come collapsing down? And that's my biggest concern about what's going into 2015. And the first and the easiest way, the step that we have to take 
is to call things for what they really are. So when somebody sits out there and tells you, well, the unemployment rate is 36 or 7 percent, stop them and say, no, it's not. It's actually going at least double that or more. And try to get back to using real indicators, and that will give us an idea of just how bad the situation is. When you're, there's no interest being paid on anything, the only place to go is to, into the stock market. If the stock market's manipulated so that it can't lose, uh, we now passed more legislation just recently to protect the banks. The banks were too big to fail. We couldn't let them fail. When they looked at us and said, we're going to fix this, we're going to take care of Main Street before we do Wall Street, it was just the exact opposite that they did. Just think about if you had taken those trillions of dollars and did exactly what they had said and what they had promised. They knew what the answer was. It was to take care of the infrastructure, build bridges, put the pipes on the ground, rejuvenate those cities. Those people who have been working, they've been union jobs, they've been non-union jobs. They would have been rebuilding the infrastructure, the highways. There would have been something to show for the dollars that we created out of nothing, those fiat dollars, those trillions. And then people would have spent that money they earned building those bridges and putting those pipes underground and redoing our infrastructure on buying toasters and bicycles and every other consumer item. And it would have generated our economy and given us something to show for what we've done. But instead, we've had trillions of dollars that have just evaporated. They're gone. All we have is trillions of dollars worth of debt. So I think 2015 is going to be the year that we have to address the decade or so, at least the last six, seven years, of not uh, handling our economic situation in a manner in which we know the right thing to do, and we've not done it. And so get back to capitalism, get back to responsible economic theories, and tell the truth. I think the American people deserve it, and we need to be able to understand just how dire the circumstances are if we're going to make decisions. But we're living currently in a false economy, and we cannot continue because at some point people – right now what's happening is uh, people stop buying our debt. People start bu stop buying our bonds. And right now there's uh, – I think it's Belgium, some small country – has got this enormous amount of U.S. debt that's being purchased. Well, it's not being purchased by that country. It's being purchased by the U.S. through them. The United States is out there purchasing its own debt, and we can't continue to do that. It's a family living off the credit cards to pay off the credit cards and ordering new credit cards to pay off those. And eventually it all comes crashing down, and that's where we're at. So these false... Uh, things you hear about the economy and how well it's doing or something that I would ask everybody in 2015 to make sure that when you see it in the press or somebody sits out there and tells you that or a local official or a state official or a federal official, call them on it. Ask them to explain it. If they can't explain it and they don't understand it, then there's a, a bigger problem. So that's my uh, concern, my biggest concern for 2015, and I'd love to hear yours. Um, if you can call in and let us know what your concerns are, that's something that uh, we'd like to address today. One of the other things that um, I think we need to watch out for, and I think is going to be, we're going to see a lot more of, are executive orders. The Obama administration has decided that it will operate as though he is the emperor, and he will issue executive orders and shame on our Congress shame on our elected officials for not protecting that branch of government that is supposed to act as a check and a balance and allowing the executive to do things which clearly are outside of his constitutional powers. And so it's incumbent upon us, the people who expected those we elected to go in and actually do their jobs, to hold them accountable. And so every week, we should say, have we called somebody, our congressmen, our local officials, to tell them that we're watching and to make sure they understand that we know what it is that they should be doing. And when 
an elected official comes back, takes their break from Congress, they tell us, well, here's what I'm doing. Ask them what they did to stand up for the separation of powers. Did they stand on the floor and call it for what it is? It's not enough just to vote right. And unfortunately, they're not even voting right. They're allowing these things to take place, which should never take place, um, with regards to uh, the illegal immigrants and the executive order to allow them into the country. Uh, we were told and promised they would fight that, and instead we had Republicans stand up and acquiesce in it. Where was the outrage, the, uh, the most horrific thing that happened last year in 2014 was when all the Democrats in Congress voted for a bill to take away your First Amendment rights. They wanted to change your First Amendment rights, change the Constitution, and they actually voted to limit your ability to have free political speech. Where was the outrage? It was barely mentioned. And if they think that they can be so emboldened to actually go and publicly make a vote to take away our constitutional rights, to change our Bill of Rights in such a dramatic fashion, what's next? So I don't think 2015 bodes well for us as far as protecting our constitutional rights. Look right here in Maryland. You see what O'Malley just did on his way out the door? He just last week, he decides, I'm going to commute the sentences of four convicted murderers who were given the death penalty. Two of those persons who were convicted have, were convicted of being hit persons. They were paid $9,000 to kill a witness. How can you commute the sentence of somebody who agrees to murder for hire? that they're going to go out and kill somebody for money. Now, the problem is, which I think nobody's paying attention to, and I said last week, I tried to get an answer to the question of, can O'Malley, by commuting those sentences, make those sentences so that they are, the person will serve it without chance of parole? I'm not sure that they actually can. What we have to find out is when their trials were held, was that an option for the jury? Or did the jury only have two options, life with parole or death penalty? And if they did not have the option of life without parole, a good defense attorney is going to come in and argue after O'Malley's gone that these convicted murderers, who he says he's commuting their sentences from death penalty to being life without parole may not get life without parole. They may get life with parole because a court may rule you can't commute the sentence to something that didn't exist at the time the sentence was given. And so I'm asking everybody to pay attention to this one. It may not be as it seems, and by the time O'Malley is gone, it won't be his problem. It'll be all of our problems who live here with these people who are being having their sentences commuted and put back into society. If there's anybody we want to make sure that doesn't re-enter society, it's those who kill, not out of passion, not out of anger, not out of negligence, but for money. And who do they kill? Who do they kill? Witnesses that were going in to testify in a court of law. If you want to find any more heinous of a situation that goes towards destroying the very fabric of our government. It's having people hired to kill witnesses in our judicial system. And if that doesn't put a chilling effect on the administration of justice, I don't know what will. And for O'Malley to then say, well, we talked to the families, leaves me one question. What did the family say when you talk to them, Governor? Did the family say it's okay that my loved ones were murdered by these people and you're going to commute their sentences? Or did they say, no, Governor, please don't do that. Don't increase our harm. We weren't told what the family said. We were only told that the governor talked to them. So that's something we want to watch here in Maryland to see what actually took place there.
Hi. Hello. Eugene Craig, how you doing? Hey, Mike, how are you, brother? I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine, Eugene. It's so good to have you on. Um, Appreciate being uh, on. Uh, could you take a moment, please, and tell the uh, listeners a little bit about yourself, your background? Oh, I'm Eugene Craig. I'm the newly elected third vice chair of the Maryland Republican Party. Uh, I uh, guess I got my start in uh, 2012 as Dan Bongino's uh, statewide youth coordinator for the United States Senate campaign. Um, I'm a member of the Baltimore County Republican Census Committee, and uh, this recent election, I was the Republican nominee for Clerk of the Court of Baltimore County. Outstanding, outstanding. And uh, so you're the young, uh, you're a libertarian? Yes. And so you're the young voice of uh, where the Republican Party is going in the future, is how I've uh, put it when uh, you asked uh, uh if, for my endorsement, and I talked to you, and I loved I loved the fact that uh, some of the things that you had to say, and uh, maybe you could share with us uh, and uh, the listeners here some of the uh, thoughts that you have on libertarianism and uh, its future in uh, the Republican Party, and particularly Maryland's Republican Party. Well, uh, first, I definitely want to thank you again for your endorsement. Um, definitely would not have gotten over the line without it. Um, one of those, uh, I guess, perfect time things. Um, you know, liberty in Maryland, I think, is on the upswing. Um, it's alive and well. Um, we had some great wins this last uh, session with uh, Robin Grammer and Kristen Mealy, um, two young guys, two young guns that are about to take the state legislature by storm. Um, you know, we had some uh, nice local wins. Um, but one thing that's really important that I think is probably going to determine the future of this state is that this state overall, both on the left and the right, is trending in the, in, towards liberty. Um, now, you know, I think we still have a lot of work to do, but I think, you know, we're in probably one of the best positions uh, the libertarian movement, the conservative movement, has been in, in a very, very, very long time. Tell me about some of the problems we have with liberty that you see from uh, your vantage point in Maryland. Um, I guess on, on, on very basic levels, um, aggressive speed cameras on a local and state level. Um, okay. You know, <laughs> you know, one thing I would love to see is in every Republican county, and I say Republican county being a county that has a Republican working majority and working minority, let's get rid of these speed cameras. Um, so, 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 you know, you know I, I, I put the bill in to get rid of speed cameras um, each year, each session, and one of the problems that we have – with them, both the speed cameras and the red light cameras, is you lose the ability to have it. Well, first off, you lose the ability to cross examine these uh, yeah. speed cameras. So there's this fiction created so that the citizens who are listening who may not be familiar with why you and I would have opposition to them, there's a fiction created. We're not going to charge you, the owner of that car, with any uh, civil or criminal crime. We're going to charge your car. Yeah. So it doesn't matter who's driving your car, you, the owner, are going to be responsible for passing. Well, charge the car and let the car pay. But what they do is they, like with the red light cameras, they slow down from the red to the yellow um, the time period. It used to be like, you know, four or five seconds. They slow it down to two and a half seconds. So where you're yeah. used to being able to go through in the yellow, they take that away. The uh, T-boning collisions in the side might go down but your rear-end collisions increase. So you have many more rear-end collisions. Now, with the speed cameras, the biggest problem that I had with those is that they, are, they say we're going to put them up in school zones and work zones. And what happens is your daughter, who's going to school, heads into school the first day, and she goes through that speed camera. She doesn't see it. It takes her picture, and she's doing you know 10 miles over or 15 miles over. The second day, she does the same thing. The third day, she does the same thing. The fourth day she does it, you're lucky. You might get the first ticket on the fifth time that she's went through that speed light camera. If yeah. there were a police officer there, she'd get an immediate behavior mm -hmm. modification from the police officer saying, young lady, slow down. She'd bring home the ticket to you. You'd say, you know, you shouldn't be speeding. Don't do it. And she learned her lesson. But now you got five yeah. tickets because of the speed cameras. There's there's a problem with that. She the bucks out your pocket. <laughs> Yeah, that's, I mean, that's all it is. It's just, it's a revenue generator. It does nothing yeah. to do with safety. 
And so, yes, I, I agree that this is some of the area where we see these liberty issues. And also, you have private companies being able to administer justice, and they get a profit for how much they're able to how, get. How, much, how many tickets they, they come back? They pull yeah. back. I, I see we, a funny story. I have a, a, a neighbor, um, a, a lady that's like a second mom to me almost. Um, you know, you used to ride the march tree together every day when I was riding up and down from D.C. Um, you know, she's a former police officer, high-ranking police officer in Baltimore City. Um, you know, she drives 95 pretty frequently. You know, they have the camera there. They, they used to have the camera there right by exit 67 where I live uh, near White Marsh. And, um, you know, you know, the law says, you know, it's supposed to be you get 12 miles over the hour. Well, you know, she would test it. You know, and she came to find, you know, a snap at eight miles, a snap at ten miles, and it would read every time she had to take it back she was doing 12. <laughs> <laughs> exactly 12 miles over the hour. <laughs> now, now the, the, that's interesting because what, one of the things that we had said in the legislature was specifically no company could get a percentage of the number of tickets they issued. And yet, that's exactly what they went out and did. And the local municipalities let them. They made the agreements. They answered the contract where they were going to get the company gets a percentage for how many tickets. And it was a Baltimore City that was had more that were incorrect than were correct. It was over 50-some percent of the tickets being issued were incorrect. Wow. Yeah, you, know, you don't have a calibration. Um, when, when you get me with radar, and I'm yeah. a practicing defense attorney, been a defense attorney for, you know, 20-some years, um, when you get them on radar, you get to say, did you use the tuning fork? Was it working? You can bring them in. You know that the person who checked it out, when they checked it out, how they checked it out, whether they did it appropriately, and that piece of equipment's working. When you get yeah. these, these uh, tickets, you don't have any clue whether or not anybody has checked them out, whether or not they're working, and, you know, what the calibration is. And, and we've seen objects that are pretty much standing still being marked as though they're speeding through you know, a red light area. <laughs> so, yes, I agree but, with you. There are many problems with this, and it is a liberty issue. Yeah, um, I, I think there's a lot of practical um, issues. You know, one thing I was, I was talking to someone earlier today, you know, you know, in Maryland, you know, we have, a, you, know, you know, we have a Republican governor now, and I think that's absolutely amazing. I think it's wonderful. But we still have, you know, majorities and Democrat majorities in both the House and the Senate. And, um, you know, somebody had asked me, you know, Gene, you know, what should our role be? You know, what, how can we best be effective? And, um, you know, I think one thing that, you know, I would love to see the liberty movement certainly pick up, you know, we have a lot of old laws on the books that both Democrats and Republicans, that both libertarians and conservatives and progressives could agree that are absolutely horrible. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you there. That's one of the things. And I'll give you uh, some examples but every year I put in bills to take out bad laws and to get rid of speed cameras was one. I got a bill to get rid of the Common Core. But one of the bills, when I first came in, the law was that you could not practice the trade of soothsaying, fortune-telling, or palm reading in Cecil County unless you owned property or had lived here 18 months. And it turned out this was, this was to keep gypsies from coming into town and stealing your babies. Because in the oh. 50s, they were afraid that the gypsies, so they put in a, a, um, a bill, I mean, a law that said you couldn't tell, well, some lady who's a palm reader moved from Delaware to Northeast Maryland and she sets up business and she's paying her business tax. She's got her business license. Now, I don't go to palm readers, but, you know, if, if somebody wants to do it uh, from a liberty standpoint, that's their business. Hey, that's their business. And, and so she sets it up, does everything right, and the county comes in and says, we have to shut you down because, you know, you're a gypsy. And, and pretty much, <laughs> and so, of course, I take the case on. And, you know, we, we're, we're able to um, go into court. The attorney general's office comes out and everybody and says, you know, this is uh, a ridiculous lawsuit. There's no, no justification. Well, as soon as we get to court, they say, yes, Mr. Street was right. This is from when the gypsies came down from New York. And, you know, and they used to uh, come through the county, and they didn't want them coming into town and setting up their trade. So they had to let the lady stay. Now, the funny part about when it's all over is she then starts going out to some of the local carnivals and stuff and telling the people who are doing palm reading she has to get her taste. She opens the area. <laughs> and so she comes in and asks me, will I um, uh, represent her in gypsy court? 
Um, <laughs> I said, uh, no, I'm not going to go into gypsy court. And to court. <laughs> you know what the outcome's going to be anyway? I didn't know what they were going to do, but uh, some guy comes down from New York who's the king of the gypsies and decides if it's your territory. But oh, we wow. did go into the legislature, and we were able to get the legislature to say, this law doesn't belong on the books. It takes a whole class of people who are the Romani people and says that we're not going to allow them to practice a trade. It wasn't any different, though, if you look in the newspaper and you see that they have a fortune in the newspaper for, or your horoscope, and it's yeah. no different than what they were doing. So how could you put it in the newspaper or have somebody sell The state has the exclusive on selling lottery tickets and such. So you couldn't do these things, the soothsaying and uh, such um, unless you were, I guess, the state or a newspaper. But Super. that's another example <laughs> of ridiculous laws that are on the books that um, you need to get off. And, um, yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of them need to be changed, especially from the, the liberty standpoint. You know, I, I'm not a big supporter of, you know, going out and uh, getting my palm read, but if somebody wants to do that, that's their prerogative. Yeah, I agree with you. So, okay, um, so if you've got any ideas of any of the laws that you want to see, taken off from a liberty standpoint that the central committees are going to back? Um, I think, well, well, I think we should address Common Core and our things like 16, we have absolute control majority in and and, and on a local level. Um, I think we have the best opportunity to deal with Common Core straight up uh, at the local level, you know, so please put it, you know, uh, we're not going to spend local money on this monstrosity. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and there's no way, I mean, you talk about the 10th Amendment, and a separate and, and and the starting point I would ask is show me anywhere in the Constitution that the federal government has a right to say that they're going to have any say in education. That's yeah. perhaps, and what they what they do to get around it is they create this fiction. We're not telling you that you put this in, but if you want any money for your highways, <laughs> you know they they make this the tie a fiscal tie, or we're going to give everybody who voluntarily accepts it money. But those who I'll put it. I'll stuff. put it this way. I'll put it this way. In Maryland, here we have NASA, we have the NSA, we have uh, the entire VA system, uh, we have Fort Meade, we have APG. Um, I would be if I, if I was a betting man, I would put my cash on Governor Hogan if it came down to uh, you know the governor standing up to the president and the president making that threat. I guarantee that money is still flowing here. <laughs> oh, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right, and that's and some of the states have done that. So, I mean, what I you need to say is, what I've suggested is that the federal government's going to tell us that we're going to withhold highway money unless you accept this dealing with your education or there's this other tie to getting these funds. And the states need to say, guess what? You don't have any authority under the Constitution, so you send us a bill and we'll send you the taxes that you're entitled to. So if they're going to play that, you know, the game of withholding funds that they don't have any constitutional right to, then you need a governor. Who's going to, I mean, one of the things that's interesting is you can't get, at least when there's a Democratic governor, a Democratic mm -hmm. legislature to do anything, they allow the governor to set public policy. And the legislature is supposed to set that policy. Yeah. And so, so they won't allow that to happen. One of the things I got upset about when we were getting ready to take our National Guard troops and this was over 10 years ago, and they were sending them off to Afghanistan and other places. I wanted a simple um, resolution that said the, the President of the United States cannot take the state of Maryland's National Guard troops and send them anywhere in this country without the governor of Maryland's permission. Permission. So the governor, and then I wanted the governor of Maryland to say, yes, I agree that our National Guard troops should be sent somewhere. And I think that's a very simple, um, you know, uh, Absolutely. They, they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. <laughs> you know, and, I'll tell you, our buddy's in Annapolis. Yeah, absolutely. Can you stick with us still? Uh, oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. When we come back, we're going to have uh, Mr. Eugene Craig, and we're going to discuss some more issues with regard to... The kind you want on Liberty Works Radio Network.
America. Born to freedom. The Liberty Revolution is on. Liberty Works Radio Network. Truth in broadcasting. It's not easy being a veteran. Coming back from Iraq or Afghanistan. Not everyone understands that. You don't feel the same. Join us at communityofveterans.org and connect to others who are going through the same thing. Because no one knows what it's like to come back unless they were there. Brought to you by Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. I know what you're going through. I've been there. This is Randall Year out. Now live from coast to coast and around the globe, more real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. I'm with Mike Spiegel, and we're here with Eugene Craig, and we're at the Liberty Works Radio Network, LWRN.net, and you can call in at 410-848-9191. And when we left, Eugene, we were talking about some of the things that you think that we should repeal from a liberty standpoint that are currently bills um, that or programs that are active in Maryland, and we were just mm-hmm. talking about Common Core. Is that correct? Absolutely. Um, I put the bill in to get rid of Common Core. We were talking about the reasons that uh, people take common, take it in the first place. It's because they, there's this misperception that federal money is free money. Um, they don't realize it comes from the taxpayers and the constituents that they represent anyway in the state house, uh, But the idea that we should accept this uh, mandate from the federal government on how we will educate our children is uh, probably, as, as I've said, if you like Obamacare, you're going to love Common Core because it is the equivalent of interference with something that um, is working. I mean, it's just absolutely horrific what they're trying to do with education and it's going to ruin it. And the reason we have a Tenth Amendment is to allow states to be able to experiment. And this is uh, completely anathema to that idea. I agree. I agree 100 percent. You know, I think I'm the big Tenth Amendment guy. Um, you know, you know, I say, you know, the Fed, and I think we've gotten to a point in time in our, in our you know, lifetime, our political lifetime, where the federal government has gotten so big and so large, you know, I have a friend, uh, Liberty Girl on Facebook. Um, you know, I know her personally. You know, she spent about four hours just trying to find a compiled list of every single agency and bureau that falls under the federal government. And the federal government had gotten so large that they don't even have a full list themselves of every bureau and agency that falls under their, their the federal government. You know, it, it's gotten out of control. And, um, you know, you know, and, you know, Common Core is just one example of how, you know, Fed's trying to control the states um, with federal dollars, um, largely when it comes to uh, transportation, education. Uh, and, and what makes that whole scenario that you just outlined even uglier is that we don't even have the list, and the federal government doesn't have a list of how many organizations it has, and yet each of those is promulgating regulations. And yep. those regulations have been allowed to take on the force of law, when in fact they have no legal basis whatsoever um, as far as being able to institute law. A regulation has to be based on Absolutely. You know, and, that's, and that, that's what makes it ten times worse. Um, you know, there's a couple hundred regulations coming out every single day. Um, just watch the federal registry. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, and we, can't, we can't comment fast enough. And being able to put forth the suggestion that the legislators regulation should have to cite to the exact section of the law that gave it the authority and that it is implementing because they literally um, I've heard don't worry about it when they try to pass something that fails in the legislature we'll take care of it in regulation well uh, we've had several instances where we specifically as legislators say no to something 
and that specific legislation that we said no to is implemented through regulation. And we sit there watching the very agencies that we decided they exist countermand the public policy established by the uh, legislature, which is, you know, the tail wagging the dog. And when you call out the Democrats on that and you say, stand up for this legislature, stand up for its independence, and tell the state police you cannot do this because we said no, there would not be a firing requirement under SB 281. We took Mm -hmm. it out. And yet the state police just go ahead and say, well, we're going to stick it in. Um, I could go through, you know, probably a dozen examples where things like this happen, where we say no to something, and they just decide we're going to go ahead and put that in. Um, So that's something that uh, I would hope that the central committees can, you know, even if it's just educating the uh, central committee members out there to watch locally, because when it happens at the federal level, it makes it easier to happen at the state level, which Mm -hmm. doesn't happen at the county level and the municipal level. Yep, so, absolutely. So, so what, are, what are some of the ideas, some of the things that you want to bring from the Central Committee, um, uh, the, uh, sorry, the party, this um, to the Central Committees to help them understand and do their jobs more effectively? Well, um, you know, when I ran for third vice chair, I ran on the platform of three things. Um, first thing is that, you know, we want to start uh, building our farm team. So, you know, we, over the next couple of months, we're going to be working and implementing a Young Guns Initiative where, you know, we bring some of our older guns, uh, you know, bring some of our, our more seasoned uh, delegates, bring some of our, uh, you know, our, our holders of knowledge on certain issues in, and, you know, put our young up-and-coming activists and candidates for upcoming elections uh, through a pretty, pretty rigorous um, program where they'll be the best candidate they possibly can be. Um, you know, one thing that myself and a lot of the other young candidates um, – you know, realize and kind of experience in this last election was that being that we haven't been around forever, um, well, not, you know, not say forever, but, you know, have been around as long as a lot of other people, um, you know, we didn't have the donor connections. We didn't have the connections to certain activists and whatnot. Um, but, you know, I want to help bridge that gap. That gap. So it's going to be focused largely on, and there's going to be a very, very good education aspect where once a month um, we'll bring in experts on a particular issue and, um, you know, have have them you know drill their knowledge into our young guys. Well, and, if you need know, any ex, if you need any guns, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely will. <laughs> See, uh, I, don't think I don't think there's I don't think there's anybody as strong in the state as Delegate Mike Smeek when it comes to this two way issue. I tell you that. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that, and I would I would like to say on liberty issues because. Uh, Land rights and uh, you know oh, yeah. your Fourth Amendment, your your First Amendment. Um, mm-hmm. I think one of the one of the things that I think I'd like to we need to acknowledge, and I'd like to get your take on is um, the young guns that you're talking about. There's going to be this fight between what we would call the old establishment Republicans. Mm-hmm. And then the newer libertarian Tea Party type Republicans. It's there at the national level. It's there at the state level. And there, let's not deny that there is a tension there. There is. And so, what do you do? You see any tension there? I mean, am I just seeing something? Is there, that you don't? No, no. There, there's tension there. Um, there. There's actually a lot of tension there. But um, you know, I, I will say, you know, it's. it's you know, although it shouldn't be an us against them type of thing, it, it kind of does boil down into that. Um, and I do think, you know, liberty is on the upswing. And, you know, every day I'm seeing more and more people becoming inclined to liberty, if I can use that phrase. Uh, um, and I agree with you. And the way I phrase it, and I, I want to see how you feel, look, the starting point for every conservative should be the Constitution. And Absolutely. So, I think that the libertarians find that we well, I think I'm thinking I'm losing you here. Can't hear anything. So 
don't know what happened there. Are you there? Hey, Eugene, I think we got disconnected. Uh, hey, Eugene, I'm still here. Hey, yeah, I'm here. Oh, I don't know what's going on with the... Uh, look, I don't run the show. <laughs> 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 I, got, um, I, don't know what, I don't know what's going on there. Keep going. Okay, oh, perfect, good, we're there. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I guess they got us uh, hooked back up. It was a slight interference there on the board. Um but uh, we were talking about the uh, split that seems to be there. Maybe we've got a, a conservative Republican on the board that we'll talk about that. The, um, <laughs> you know, what is? What, do you see um, an answer? Do you see it getting better? Do you see people trying to address it? I mean, you're well, young. And, I think well, you know. And, and unfortunately, on radio, people can't tell, and mm-hmm. I really don't know that it matters. But it does matter in this context. You're an African American Republican, yeah. um, correct? Mm-hmm. And so I think that that's something that the party is trying to reach out to people of color to try to expand the base. Um, and I think that that's important that people are able to get into the leadership positions and that we listen and say, what is it that's important? What attracted you? You know, is it just the basic idea that capitalism works and that uh, you understand? that um, the things that are being offered by, you know, progressives isn't the answer. I mean, we all understand green. We all understand Mm -hmm. success. I think, well, I'll say, uh, you know, my personal journey um, to the uh, conservative movement. Um, I went to a small private Christian school my entire life. Um, I started out as a very, very strong uh, social conservative. I'm actually still very, very personally social conserv- socially conservative. Um, now, do I believe I, you know, should push everything I believe on and put it in the law and, you know, force it down to people's throat? Not so much. But, um, you know, that's where I got my start. Um, you know, as a black conservative, as an African-American you know, conservative Republican, um, one thing that I understand, um, and this may, be just, may just be because of my experience, um, I have a very, 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 very diverse group of friends, um, diverse circle. Um, I would probably match my circle up against anybody's, um, whether you, whether it's, you know, based on race or, uh, ideology, you know, one thing you know, I have, I have just as many progressive friends. I've had libertarian friends. I have just as many Democrat friends. I've had Republican friends. Um, but one thing that I have come to understand is that at the end of the day, Everybody wants smaller government for themselves. Um, when it comes to my conservative friends, you know, to a lot of, you know, you know, they, we see a lot of ills when it comes to the federal government. But, you know, we may not necessarily turn a blind eye to things that happen on a local level. Eugene, we're going to be right back and we'll okay. set that up as soon as we get back, okay? No Thank problem. You. We'll try to fix this while you're gone. <laughs> Network. Truth in broadcasting. The viewpoints expressed on Liberty Works Radio Network are not necessarily those of the network, its affiliates, or sponsors. This is Liberty Works Radio Network. Now live from coast to coast and around the globe. More real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. Welcome back to the Freedom Forum with Delegate Mike Spiegel, and we're here with Eugene Craig, uh, the third vice chair of the Maryland Republican Party, newly elected, and we got the Liberty Works Radio Network, LWRN.net, and you can call in and join us at 410-848-9191. That's 410-848-9191. Eugene, 
when we yeah. left off, we were talking about uh, the libertarian versus the uh, conservative. Know, <laughs> conservative, okay. I, I consider us conservatives too, but I, I, I you know, don't want to go with status. But uh, yeah, the uh, yeah. I'd say conservative wing of the Republican Party, and um, I would think at least in my estimation, that the younger people that you're looking to get, these young guns and others, um, are more inclined to be uh, those who are looking towards Tea Party, towards the Constitution, um, mm-hmm. and, and being of the uh, those who say, you know, first and foremost, we're going to require that whatever party uh, that, we're, that we're in or whatever policy that we're following that it be something that comes from the Constitution. And is that something that you're seeing with the young guns, that they are coming from this uh, background? Absolutely. Um, you know, I was saying before we uh, went to break that, you know, regardless of where I see across the spectrum, um, people want smaller government. Um, and it's generally, hey, you know, I want smaller government for me, although I really probably don't care what happens to you. Um, you know, we, and we see, and one of the things I'm starting to find is that, you know, we see smaller government, um, in different ways, um, or more so we see big government in different ways. Um, one thing I know as conservatives, you know, we generally, you know, harp a lot about the feds, you know, IRS is on our backs, um, you know, investigating Tea Party groups, um, you know, DOJ, Fast and Furious. Um, you know, EPA is out of control. And trust me, I've seen it from the inside. EPA is out of control. <laughs> um, you know, Congress is out of control. Like, we see big government at the federal level. But, you know, we're more inclined to let things that are on the local level um, slide. And, you know, my liberal friends, you know, you know, they see a lot of ills that happen on the local level um, that, that may not and, and, and may ignore things that happen on the federal level. And, you know, one thing I love about the liberty movement is that, you know, you see things that happen on the global and say, hey, that has to stop. You know, that's oppressive government. That's big government at its, at its worst. Um, you let, see let things me, at the federal level and say, hey, that has to stop. That's big government at its worst. And try to deal with both. <laughs> and I think that's where a lot of young people are coming from. Uh, well, that's, that's excellent. And let, let me ask you, if, uh, with the Hogan administration coming in, and the number one issue going to be our economic situation. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think of the idea and getting the hopefully the party to uh, work with us in this area where you're talking about smaller government? What the Democrats seem to do very effectively is they come before the legislature and they look in their TV cameras and look out and say, what do you want to uh, fund? Do you want to fund these children who are going to the Baltimore school system and have to have a breakfast and a lunch, or do you want to fund a giant tax break for corporations? And when they put those two out there, obviously everybody doesn't want to see children going without eating, and they try to make it look like all of us conservatives are just for the corporations. Mm -hmm. Why don't we, now that we're going to have a governor come in and say, we have to address this structural deficit of over a billion dollars, and it's continuing to grow now. And then uh, there's talking for another 600,000 or so, um, 600 million, excuse me, that's going to come up in the next um, year that uh, has to be taken care of in the structural deficit. And that's not even talking about the 37 billion with a B that Maryland is short on the pension funds. <laughs> so that we've got to address these. Why not then we take a page and say, what is it you want us to do? Do you want us to fund those children who are going in for their breakfast and their lunch in the schools? Or do you want us to fund the Maryland State Department of the Environment or the Maryland State Department of Planning when every single county has one already? So if every county has a Department of Planning and every county has a Department of the Environment, I mean, we've got some low-hanging fruit. You're going to say no to the red line, no to the purple line, or save $5 billion there. But why Mm -hmm. can't we get rid of some of these large monolithic, um, overly intrusive, do nothing but generate excessive regulations and cost us jobs, departments such as the Maryland Department of the Environment and the Department of Planning. It used to be that – go ahead. I agree 200% with you. 
Um, you know, we've gotten the issue. We, we've gotten to the point where we've been branded as Republicans as a party of no. Um, and, you know, to some degree, you know, we are the ones that are standing up for saying no to a lot of the crap that's coming out of Annapolis and D.C. But, you know, being that we have control of power, being that we have the governorship, I think if you put a real choice on the table in front of voters, if you put a real choice on the table in front of citizens and people, I think, you know, I, I'm inclined to think that, that they'll support it. Um, you know, and we have to provide the op, but we have to first provide the option. Um, you know, it doesn't help your case if you're saying no to this, but not giving me an alternative. You know, uh, you have a billion you. dollar deficit. Hey, how are you going to clean this up? We, you know, I, if I was going to say, if I was Governor Hogan, I would first thing I would say, you know, we're not going to hurt families. Um, actually, we're going to empower them by doing X, Y, Z. I agree wholeheartedly, and um, one of the things um, that we used to do was with the. Um, the Department of the Environment, the Department of Planning, they used to just be advisory. So you'd have a very small county that couldn't afford to have an environmental expert working for the county, and you'd have somebody with a circuit rider and such, and they'd go out and say, well, you know, you want to make sure that you do this, you do that, and they'd give advice. Now they become regulatory and yeah. overlook, and, and that's created all these additional regulations. Um, we're looking just because Maryland has decided to interpret its um, uh, duties under federal law with the Clean Water Act and such, the billion-dollar price tags being placed on these counties, which will absolutely bankrupt them. And we don't have yeah. to choose to do so much more than is actually required. And no is an answer. When, when, when the party of no, guess what? I used to say, well, no is, is an answer. If you don't like the answer, it might not be the answer you want to hear, but no is an answer. And so, yeah. you know, there's nothing wrong with being the party of no sometimes and saying, oh, no, I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. It. I think we should be the party of no. Um, but I do think we, I think we failed um, in a lot of respects of being, of, of putting the conservative philosophy into policy. I think we would win so many more battles, so many more debates. If we had a policy alternative, a liberty-based alternative, a market-based alternative thing in paper and policy, you know, hey, here's the bill. Take a vote on it. <laughs> no, no, um, here, and here's the, here's, here's the problem there. Until the Republican Party accepts libertarianism or accepts the idea of that this is where we're going to go and what the future is, we're going to have a hard time developing and presenting that policy. Absolutely. I think, you, and I think you're going to have a hard time. It's a great idea. It is what we need to do to have that Young Guns program. Mm -hmm. But you're going to have a hard time as soon as they realize, wait a minute, what he's doing is building the very thing we're trying to become entrenched against and still say no to and not accept. You yeah, know, I, I, I went down – but. Oh, you go first. <laughs> Uh, I was going to say, I went down to the Republican convention um, when we had it down in Florida, um, and I was down there, and I was uh, Rand Paul, uh, excuse me, uh, Ron Paul at the time. Um, I was picked to represent, you know, represent Ron Paul. And we went down, and our Republican uh, tried to stop him from speaking. And I thought, this is absolutely wrong. If we are for all of these things and for everybody having a voice, how can you possibly bring us together when you've got people now um, saying we're not even going to allow you to speak at our convention. Um, yeah. That was a big mistake. Mm -hmm. And and we're continuing Absolutely. to make that same mistake. So instead of welcoming and bringing in the libertarians and bringing in those ideas and ac accepting, you know, even if you want to say, okay, we won't talk about social issues because I know most libertarians um, are not going to be coming out and saying, I mean, marijuana policy, we don't care. You want to be against marijuana, be an ultra-conservative, that's your prerogative, but you don't have to have a policy from the party um, yeah. with regards to that. I think it makes good economic sense, and from a libertarian sense, um, we don't need the government, but it's, you know knows it with respect to that um, uh, issue. It's, it's, you know, it's uh, one of those things where, you know, both from, I, I saw Republicans voting against 
having a bill that would allow the growing of hemp for industrial use. Not, not, smoking, <laughs> not medical marijuana, but because the word hemp appeared in the bill. And I was like, do you understand? This is to give farmers an alternative crop to allow yeah. them to make rope. You know, nobody's uh -huh. going to be smoking the rope. But, uh, you know, the, 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 the idea is uh, still entrenched. And I think, yes, the party is moving toward that. I think you got a great idea with the young guns. And that was only the first of the three ideas. So what are some of the other, um, your platform, the other uh, two? Uh, the second one is that we're going to get some wins in Montgomery County and Prince George's County. Um, there's some great municipal elections coming up. Um, you know, they're not technically nonpartisan, but, you know, we got some great pickup opportunities. And I'm going to be uh, you know, working hard down there, um, along with uh, John Wafer and uh, Heather Olson, who's the chair of uh, – PG over there in uh, Higgs, who's true over in Montgomery County, you know, we're going to get some wins in these two counties. Um, you know, start building our farm team, start getting some representation out there. Um, you know, one thing that, you know, you know, as a, you know, elected official, you know, people will base off of policy and principle, but they'll base off a relationship more than either of those two. And, you know, it's hard as, it's hard as a, as a, a newcomer coming in and saying, hey, vote for me because of X, Y, Z, I believe X, Y, Z, rather than if you're an incumbent or if you've been elected somewhere else or if you have some kind of relationship with that community already, you come in and say, hey, this is what I believe, this is what I've done, and this is why you should give me this opportunity. And that's what I want to start help building in Montgomery County and Prince George's County. I think that's an excellent idea, um, and I'm hoping that uh... – one of the ideas that uh, I will talk with you in the next section about, um, and I hope you can stay with us one last session um, oh, yeah, if you're available, sure. um, is with respect to Montgomery County. And one of the things that I'm hoping that we would do is I watched at the last redistricting and how uh, Penamelnik and uh, some others talked about having a majority minority district in Montgomery County. And that's something that the Republicans should work with the uh, Democrats, especially the Black Caucus and members in Montgomery County, to develop. Because if we're able to help them bring those lines in where they should be, get rid of the gerrymandering, and make Montgomery County um, much more of a Democratic county, then what happens is those those persons who they've – what they've done is gerrymander it. And yeah. you will have more – congressmen who are Republicans in Congress, and you'll have actually black representatives from Montgomery County in Montgomery County, they would be in Congress. And so to make it a minority, majority minority district um, is something that would put us towards moving towards having real um, lines that uh, were, as the Constitution requires, based on county boundaries and such. And that's something that um, I would hope that we start talking this year I agree. about, and so that three years from now, when it comes down for Hogan to run again, he mm -hmm. says, guess what, and this is something you as Republicans would sit down with them and work out the lines and say, we know what we're going to get if he gets a second term. We're going to get actual lines that we've helped set up as independents, and not just the governor drew up, but this organization drew up. And if we had people like yourself in that group and they sat down and drew up those lines, everybody would know what they're getting and probably yeah. would keep some people voting for him for that next four years so that when he gets a chance to draw those lines, they're lines that would actually benefit the majority minority community. And we'll be right back. Kind you want on Liberty Works Radio Network. Back to Freedom Forum with Delegate Mike Spiegel. And my guest here is Eugene Cray, who is the third vice chair of the Maryland Republican Party, newly elected. And you can talk to us at 410-848-9191. That's 410-848-9191 if you want to call in and speak to Mr. Cray or myself. And uh, Eugene, where we left, left off, you were telling me about how you want to get into Montgomery County and get some votes in there and get some people elected there. And you're going to make a real effort at that. I think that's a tremendous. The one thing Montgomery County would be, um, it seems to me, 
a gold mine for Republicans and for Republicans like yourself is in the untapped resources towards being able to get some um, finances in there. You've got Republicans who are probably well off and um, have nowhere else to go, and you know the, they, they've been struggling to try to get seats there, and it seems that that would be a good place to probably um, do some fundraising for local Republicans or Republicans who are running in Montgomery County. And I think that that's something that uh, could uh, work is showing them how to, you know, raise money in those areas. Well, you know, um, what, I had a fundraiser, a professional fundraiser, about a year and a half ago um, tell me that Montgomery County is the number one, well, it's number one, it's something like number one, or when it, definitely in the top five um, donor counties for the RNC. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. That's that's proves my point, I guess. The yeah, um so, so, no, but, but you know, but but for a while, you know one thing I'm I'm learning, um I'm learning actually really quick, is that um our big donors, you know, typical huge, you know, probably good donors, um, you know, historically what they've seen is that uh, you know, they see activity on a national level and they want to be engaged there because they see a value for their money there. Um, but they haven't necessarily seen that here on a local level, on a state level. So, you know, I think, you know, we have to get to a point where, you know, hey, we, we're getting a finally these people saying, hey, you know, the MDGOP is alive, the MCGOP is alive. Um, and, you know, we have real opportunities here, and but we can't succeed without your support. And but, but, you know, it comes it also comes down to this. Once they give you your support, their support, you know, you have one shot, one shot to make it happen, and we have to make it happen. You know, same thing with Governor Hogan. You know, um, you know a lot of people, you know, went on a limb and supported him this this in the last election. Um, you know, this you know he has to be a four years to to make it a success. I I would agree wholeheartedly, and I think that the planning. Um, what I've said about the governor's race here is uh, if he runs as though he only has four years and mm-hmm. not as though he wants eight, he's going to do very well. You know, my yeah. concern is if you start running like you want eight, you start being hesitant about putting in those programs and those things that you wanted to do, thinking you'll do them in your four, your second four. Well, you know, go in there, you got the mandate, and uh, do everything that you – people will see the results. People will see – that you're doing exactly what you told them you were going to do, and I think they will reward you with a second term if you actually accomplish the things that you, uh, or at least try to accomplish. You, only, you know, blame it on the legislature because it's obvious the legislature is going to end up standing in a way. This is going to be a short honeymoon. The first time, yeah, it's a very short honeymoon. Professor, maybe a couple hours. Professor agenda. <laughs> so, well, all right, so we got Montgomery County, and we got Young Guns. What was the third leg of your uh, platform? Well, the- Defining the party on our terms, um, you know, we've been in a position where um, we've either had a Democrat governor and super majorities in both houses or a Republican governor and super majority in both houses. Um, this is the last cycle. We have a Republican governor, regular majority in both houses, still a super majority in the Senate, but a regular majority in the House. But we have overwhelming wins on the county and local level. Which means that, you know, for the first time in a very, very long time, we are in a position to define our party on our terms. And, you know, we really, you know, this is another one of those one-time gigs, one of those one-shot gigs where, you know, we can't screw it up. <laughs> can, you give us, can, you give, can you give us a couple examples of things that you would think that we need to define on our terms? Where the um, Democrats are trying to define us and where you would change it. Well, first thing, um, I think low-hanging fruit, um, every county that is run by either a Republican majority on the Board of Commissioners or County Council or as a Republican county executive should be implementing school choice tomorrow. You know, absolutely. You know, this, this is me personally. You know, charter, really charter, know, school, charter schools and vouchers. You know, on the local level. You know, I realistically can't look at Prince George's County or look at uh, uh, Baltimore City and say, hey, your school sucks, so what you should do is go ahead and, and, and implement school choice when here in my own county I still have the old system. You know, it makes me I, you know, semi-hypocritical, I'll be honest about it. Um, uh, but I do think, you know, I am a big school choice. I'm, you know, I'm 
kind of a prodigal school choice. You know, just have my parents, you know, made it happen for me and my brothers to go to private school for the time that we did. Um, but, you know. And, and, I, and, and again, we do, it, we do it in the manner in which the Democrats have done it. You make the choice. We're either going to have to cut out your school lunch program or we're going to open a charter school over here and we're going to give vouchers to the parents who want to take their kids out of the schools that have problems and we're going to have to close a couple of those schools. You know, you give them the, the Hobbesian's choice of, well, who wouldn't want to have new schools open and keep the kids having their school lunch um, and have an opportunity to have some of your children, you know, get the vouchers to go to those schools? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, you put the, you put, definitely this, you put the choice in the parents' hands it's parent one. The parent gets a lot more involved. Um, we, one thing we do know is that the more involved the parent is, more like the more successful the child's going to be. That's the first and, thing. And you, but if you, put you know who the biggest who the biggest hurdle is going to be, it's going to be those oh. who are supposed to be looking out for the children. So we have teachers unions. Oh yeah, I know, <laughs> I know. But you know, the the essence of the teachers union is that they're the union of the teachers looking out for the teachers. And I think a lot more parents are wising up and opening their eyes and seeing that. Um, you know, you know, teachers, I love teachers. You know, I have a lot of friends that are, you know, graduating and going on becoming teachers. Um, they have some of the biggest hearts in the world. Um, but you know, a lot of time the leadership that they look to to protect them doesn't always have their best interests at heart. You know, I like to use the example of what happened in DC with Michelle Ree, um, you know, eight years or so yes. past. You know, yes. if you you come and you tell a teacher, Hey, I'll double your salary based on your on, on your performance and your union votes it down because it doesn't provide the same level of of entitlement and, and quote unquote protection of safety. That's ludicrous. You mean to tell me that you you, you would much rather <laughs> keep your you bad take, teachers. Right. The the unions are taken from a merit system, which mm-hmm. education should be about. You get the higher grade, you do better, you're going to do better in life and turn try to turn it into the same thing that we're doing now with schools by saying, Well, this is a um, a project for the group, and you're all going to get the grade of the you know lowest person. And, you know, I remember my son coming home and telling me, "Dad, there's four of us in the group, and he's doing the work for two other people, saying they don't care, and I'm going to get stuck with the grade." And I said, "No, that's not the way life works. You know, you get fired if you go in yeah. and you want your own work. But in school, that's the way it works, and that's the way they want to do. Is you know, we're going to support the teachers, um, no matter what." The, I, I'm just amazed at the ability that sometimes they have with um, – I've seen where they've said it doesn't matter if you're a algebra teacher. Teaching is teaching. So mm-hmm. we can have somebody who doesn't have an algebra degree teaching algebra to students. They don't understand it themselves. They can't teach it. And they yeah. should be able to take the very same test that the students take and pass it. And what is wrong with insisting upon there being an ability to perform – and your pay being tied to that. That's the problem. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, but I, I was going to say, you know, there's one thing I didn't really run on, but it's kind of like an unspoken thing because I've been doing it forever, and that's going to be outreach. <laughs> it's, it's what? What is it? Out, outreach. Okay. Outreach on behalf of the good? party. Okay. And, and, and outreach to minority groups and organizations? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think, you know, um, you know, Baltimore City and Baltimore County, you know, we're in a really, really unique position here where, you know, you know, Baltimore City, you know, I'm, I'm working. That's one of the ca- cities and counties I've been assigned, um, you know, to work with on behalf of the state party. Um, and I think, you know, they're in a unique position where they you know, are in a position where they can define the party for the entire state based off of the work that they do. You know, there isn't much they can do legislatively. There isn't much they can do to affect the policy. But when it comes to the branding um, of the Republican Party, you know, they're on the front lines. Um, uh, the help, and, go ahead. Uh, help us. You're, as an African-American, libertarian, Republican, who is out there now um, working hard in the party, just got the third vice chair, what message do you want? to send to all of the listeners out here and everybody who is a Republican looking to expand the party to say, here's what we need to do as a party for outreach. Give us your message of what we need to learn, because we think we know the answers, but here's somebody who's actually out there. <laughs> so, so tell us. Uh, I love that. I, mean, I love really. that right there. Um, first thing, the first thing you have to do is learn the culture, learn the people that you're 
dealing with you, looking to help. Um, you can't actively provide me a solution if you don't know my problem. All right. Um, I think one. Now, and I'll, I'll, be, I'll be quite frank here. I think one of the bigger issues that we have is a lot of a lot of um, African American conservatives have sold out for fame and money um, rather than actual wins. Um, you know, people are more interested in hearing and saying what people want to hear rather than telling them what they need. Um, you know, I say get involved in the community. Find out what people actually need, and you will probably be surprised. Most people want small government. Um, you know, I joke around with some of my guys in Baltimore City. I said, you know, um, you know, we could run. <laughs> I told them, I said, you know, I told, you know, I told my Democrat friends, I said, you guys, you know, they said, they, you no, know, they tell me, Mike, they said they'll be terrified if we ever run a candidate that says two things. One, um, focus on the city, the economy of Baltimore City. And two, you know, reign in the Baltimore City Police Department. Um, now, for the record, I am not anti-police. Anybody that knows me knows. Um, I have quite a few police friends. I am a big supporter of law enforcement. Um, I respect the job they do. It's one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. I think there's an absolute role for police. Um, but with any industry, with any group, with any organization, um, you have to deal with your bad apples to protect your good name. And I think, you know, one thing as conservatives that we have to understand is the history between the African-American community and the police. You know, I'll give an example, right? I'm going to do a slight timeline here. All right. The things that happened in the 60s, 60s and 70s, where, you know, you may have actually had actual racist police. You know, and I'm not saying police are racist here. I'm saying, but, you know, during that time period. I understand. You had, you, had, you had water hoses and attack dogs. Yeah, yeah. The, tro- now, the, 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 the people that were coming up and that lived through that are my parents, <laughs> or my parents' age, yeah. all right? So they carry that legacy to their children, all right? You know, when, when, I, when I talk to my kids from my experience and my perspective, that's what I pass them. Hey, be careful. This may happen. Not saying that it will happen, but it's a possibility that it may happen, all right? You have the 80s and 90s where things tempered down, but, you know, you had the big war on drugs, all right? Those are, you know, your 30 and 40-year-olds right now who may not carry the same strong feelings that your 50 and 60-year-olds may carry, but they're still there to a large degree, all right? Um, And, you know, they're passing those down to, you know, the current children of today. Um, Now you come to my generation, all right? I think my generation is probably the most unique generation that we've ever had in America, um, because you're going to see the least amount of racism, least amount of sexism, least amount of homophobia, the least amount of xenophobia come out of any generation that's going to be my generation. Um, because we grew up with diverse cultures. We grew up embracing everything. Um, I could probably grab any random person under the age of 30 and quote a random Jay-Z line, and, and he probably could finish it. And the same thing would be with that person, quote, probably a random Kenny Chesney line or a random Luke Bryan line, and I could finish it. I mean, the, there's, it's, 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 and I think, you know, one thing is conservatives is that we have to understand different cultures. Um, and I spoke to the Facebook staff, and it got a little, some people wild up. I said, you know, you can't live in paranoia and freedom at the same time. I understand. You just can't. And Mr. Eugene, I want to thank you so much for being with us. Um, I, I wish you were able to stay for the last segment, but I understand that you have to run. Um, and, I appreciate uh, you having me on, Mike. Anytime. Well, <laughs> thank you so much, and we will have you back. The kind you want on Liberty Works Radio Network. Welcome back to Freedom Forum with Delegate Mike Schmiegel at the Liberty Works Radio Network, LWRN.net. Call in 410-848-9191. That's 410-848-9191. I want to thank our guest today, uh, Eugene Craig, who is the third vice chair of the Maryland Republican Party. Uh, Eugene uh, spent some time telling us about his ideas for uh, what, Liberty uh, can be brought back into the Republican Party and how he's planning on uh, reaching out to 
what he calls young guns who are going to bring, come into the party and helping expand the ideas of liberty within the Republican Party. And I think that's a great opportunity with his now being on the central, uh, excuse me, on the uh, party leadership in Maryland and being able to work with the central committees in all the different counties, and especially having a young African-American um, of Eugene's caliber who's going to go into Montgomery County, and he's going to say, guess what, I'm going to bring the message of conservatism to Montgomery County, and we're going to work on trying to win seats there locally. It's a great task ahead, but uh, if you listened in and heard Eugene, you think uh, there's somebody who's up to the task. So kudos to all of the Central Committee members who saw uh, enough in this man to uh, vote to put him in there as third vice chair and to see if he can lead the party. Um, going back towards the Constitution, accepting it, and working with those new uh, libertarians who've been elected and are going into Annapolis and are going to hopefully pick up the um, mantle uh, and, and move forward with the uh, cause of liberty. Number one and foremost is the Constitution, to make sure that the constitutional principles, the Federalist Papers, the ideas that our forefathers uh, put forth are upheld, and to make sure that the uh, party stands for something, and the starting point is the Constitution. And I'm hoping that the rift that is out there um, is slowly but surely torn down as these new young Republicans come in, and as the message uh, spreads that it's all about uh, saying that there is nothing wrong with capitalism. There is nothing wrong with being able to uh, stand out as being successful, being able to um, actually succeed. And so these are things that uh, used to be something that we would cherish and we would uh, try to support. And so some of the ideas uh, that uh, we heard Eugene talk about, uh, I really like. I like the idea that he's going to go out there and say, let's um, actually try to uh, locally institute where we have Republicans in our local government um, at the county level, some of the changes to the schools with the charter schools and to put forth the voucher programs and to try to implement those policies at a local level. Because just like we want our states to be able to experiment with um, and to have the freedom from interference by the federal government, we'd like our counties to be able to do the same without the interference from the state government. And now is the time, now is the opportunity to be able to do that as we look at the uh, efforts by the Hogan administration coming in and saying we have to cut these uh, budget expenses. Maryland doesn't have a money problem. Maryland has a spending problem, and it has to be dealt with because we're talking over a billion dollars currently uh, in excess uh, responsibilities, and the money's not there. Part of the problem is, uh, just like with the pensions and others, we say we have a balanced budget, but Maryland, um, and one of the things that we need to fix, um, is makes an unrealistic expectation on the amount of revenue that should be generated by investments that we make. And we say, oh, we're going to make it at you know, 8 or 9% next year. And so based on revenue projections that we cannot possibly meet, we say we're going to be able to balance our budget because we have these monies invested here. There, you're not making eight nine percent anywhere. You know, you'd be lucky to make two percent. And so, it's clear we're not going to make these projections. So why allow us to say we're balancing our budget with an unrealistic projection as to the amount of monies that we make? And then one of the things, and, and I talked about this earlier, um, one uh, uh, another show, um, but. I think it's important to reiterate is we have to look at the absolute ridiculous things that are done in the Maryland legislature last year. Um, Republicans backed this idea. I stood up and said it was it was horrible. We shouldn't do it. But they actually passed legislation that removed all requirements for the budget analyst position. So Maryland comes in $280 million short almost a third of a billion dollars in the projections of how much revenue we were going to have. 
So we're $280 million short. We were supposed to put $300 million into the, um, the $37 billion budget deficit for pension funds to help reduce that $37 billion budget deficit. And instead, we took the $300 million and applied it to the $280 million short in the projected budget revenues for the year to balance the budget. So that meant no money went towards the $37 billion we were short. The next bill that comes up doesn't say we're going to make sure that our budget analysts not only are accountants and that they're instead of having a master's, have to have a doctor's degree or that they, you know, graduate from, you know, an Ivy League school, that they're going to be the best in the world so that they're not almost a third of a billion dollars off on projections. We removed all requirements for them. So I literally stood up on the floor and I asked the person who was putting forth the um, bill at the time, I believe it was um, Delegate Cardin, um, the congressman's nephew, does, let me make sure I understand this, Maryland's going to have much stricter, much more professional budget analysts. We're going to make sure that we don't have these mistakes anymore in the future. And he said, well, not really. And I said, well, what is it then that we're doing? Are we really going to strip all requirements away? Because it sounds to me like somebody has a brother-in-law who's living down in the basement and their wife wants to find them a job, and they don't have a high school diploma. So next year they're going to end up being a budget analyst in the state of Maryland because if we remove all requirements for this position and this job, then that's exactly what we will be allowing. And Republicans stood up and backed that. That is absolutely wrong. It's fiscally irresponsible. It makes no sense. But the state of Maryland last year, in the midst of this crisis, and in the, you can see now what they're handing to the Hogan administration removed all requirements to hold that job. And that's something that this year we should demand, that the Republicans put in a bill that puts back those minimum requirements, that you have to have some experience dealing with budgets, that you have to be at least an accountant or have some experience working with the numbers to be able to balance the state's budget because we can't have people coming in who have no experience um, just because they're related to some politician that needs to get some relative a job in the state of Maryland. So a lot of people don't know that happened. It did happen, as ridiculous as it sounds, and we need to be able to come in and say, no, we're going to require, and that's something that I would hope that some of the new uh, people coming in and even the Republican um, Party should take up that and say, you know what, this is something that's wrong. They're the ones who should be out there going to the press and asking them to justify this. Um, we should not allow our fellow Republicans to go in and vote for such things. There's no excuse whatsoever. When something doesn't make sense, when something is that wrong, there's no reason that anybody should be able to get away with voting for something like that and not being held accountable for that vote because that's an irresponsible vote as far as I'm concerned to vote to take away the requirements that one has when those minimum requirements that were in place were not able to keep us from having almost a third of a billion dollars in deficit in our projected incomes. And this year, not only do we have currently about $1.2 billion deficit, before the next year is out, we're going to have another $600 million that we're going to be short. And that's in the structural deficit. We still have the $37 billion for the pension funds, which is unfunded. And the scary thought there that you've got to watch for that I'm seeing is that they keep talking about the ability to come in and take away your pension. If you have a 401K, if you have money that's in an IRA, the government, both at the federal level and at the state level, keep talking about the possibility that the government could take over those. I saw that there was a projection for a bill to say um, that what they were looking to do was say that the government could plan how to use your retirement monies for you. So they would come in and say, well, you know what? All these monies out there aren't being properly managed, and we'll come in and we'll take over your 401k, your uh, uh, IRA, and we'll show you how to plan for 
and uh, take care of that. And all that would mean is they're going to start raiding those. Well, that's not going to happen under a Hogan administration. Um, I hope that that's not going to happen in the future under another administration. Uh, if you're aware of it and you try to fight against that and say, no, we're not going to let it, the government get its hands on our pensions. They can't handle the money that we give them. Another one, I do see one possibility that's going to come up this session. That's going to be the cigarette tax. And they're going to come up with this idea that you have to pass the cigarette tax so that we can protect you. Well, the problem with the cigarette tax and the problem with um, that idea of protecting us from smoking and uh, keeping us from getting cancer is there was billions of dollars that we got from the tobacco cessation um, fund. Um, we won in the courts, and they gave Maryland a couple million dollars. That money wasn't spent on trying to stop uh, uh, cancer, uh, to have testing, to have people uh, get into uh, tobacco uh, smoking uh, cessation programs. They diverted those funds to other areas. So if they sincerely cared about stopping people from having cancer, uh, they would have done something with the monies that they had to do that. Instead, these tax the, the, Maryland's addicted to the taxes that they get from the cigarette tax. And I proved that when I stood up and I asked for an amendment to the bill the last time they tried to tax cigarettes. And I said, if you really care about the people and it's not about the revenue, then let's prove it. Let's make Maryland be the very first state that outlaws all tobacco. Let Maryland be the first state to say, you can't use tobacco here because we care about your citizens and your health. Now, being a libertarian, I really didn't want Maryland to do that, but I knew that there was nobody on the Democratic side who was going to stand up and vote for that because they wanted the revenue, and that's what it's all about. It's about getting the revenue from you. So when they stand up and they tell you, that they want this cigarette tax so that they can save children from smoking, so that they can save people who are getting cancer from smoking. That's all untrue. The money that they have it in the programs is rated. It doesn't go towards those programs. And if they really care about that, they just do away with the tobacco. They're not doing away with that. This is another way of stealing the uh, revenues that they're just going to say, who's, who, who's against cigarettes? Um, the most I've just recently put up, and I'd ask you to go to um, join me if you have an opportunity. And after the show, go to facebook.com uh, slash Mike Schmeagle, um, or go to www.delegatemike.com. But if you go to the uh, fa uh, facebook.com uh, slash Mike Schmeagle, you'll find I put up two of the speeches that I gave on the floor. They're very short, maybe two, three minutes. But one of them talks about the most vile and contemptible thing that I saw um, in the legislature when I was there. That's when they decided they wanted a 9% tax on the alcohol. And what they were going to do was make it a diamond drink with a link. And what they told us was, and this is back, I believe, in 2011, if you uh, brought all the children in who had special needs, children who are mentally challenged, and they told us, you want to help them, give them a diamond drink with the link. What they did was they stole the money on the floor. They didn't even steal it out of the fund. They went ahead and gave $9 million to Montgomery Schools, Prince George's, Baltimore City, and they took the money from these children before they even put it in the fund. That was filed. That was contemptible. And that's what they do with the, ta the tax money that they do here in Maryland. It's not used for the purposes that 